Hey guys, welcome to the channel. This is another exciting first look preview. This time it's the CJ Simulations Eurofighter Typhoon for Microsoft Flight Sim. In this sortie, we're going to put it through its paces. I'll show you inside and out. I'll give you a cockpit layout tour. I'll do a startup. I'll show you some MFD functionality and some data entry on the data entry panel that is fairly complicated. Before we take it off for a performance takeoff from RF Lossy, which is where we're loaded up, we'll take it supersonic, we'll go low level, and we'll finish up at Inverness for an ILS and maybe some aerobatics to throw in, in as well. You can see us here on the apron, it's got lots of underwing stores. We've got AMRAMs, ASRAMs, underwing tanks, GBUs, all the good stuff that we like to see. You also get flags, tags, blanks, and some pins going on, and the chocks, of course. So lots of stuff to look at on the outside, but remember, if you're buying this from Marketplace when it becomes available there, you will not have any weaponry, just the underwing tanks. Whilst I'm talking about underwing stores, let's talk about uh, a workaround that I've found an issue with, and that's not developer-related. I think it's my sim. But let me know in the comments if uh, if it is my sim or you know what to do to fix it. But the information for adding the AMRAMs is in pounds, but no matter what I set on my weights and balance page, it's always in kilos in the payload. So if you want to take a note here, AMRAM 152, SRAM 68, and GBU 232, then you'll know how to add uh, the stores if you have a similar issue. The underwing tanks are fairly simple because you have, just have to drag the underwing tank, external tanks, up above zero, and then you get the underwing tanks. There is the weights and balance. If we look up close, the PBR is pretty good. The textures are nice. Modeling appears far superior to anything else I've seen in the sim so far. You see lots of blanks going on. If we have a look underneath, as I pan around and talk, I'll throw up a look at the liveries that you can get. Suffice to say, you get a lot of RAF liveries. This one is nine bomber squadron uh, that operate at RAF Lossy Mouth. You also get uh, some tiger meats and you get blackjack to display aircraft. And I'm sure lots more liveries will come shortly after release. That's enough of the outside. Let's jump inside and I'll show you what you get. So the cockpit is very tidy. Again, comparing from the videos I've seen of other MSFS Typhoons, not naming any names, but it is much, much better than what you get. I will mention there is an India Fox Teco Typhoon in the works and also a DCS Typhoon if you want to jump over to DCS. But those are going to be a fair way away in terms of time. So let's have a look down to the left. Now to the left, we've got some lift up that actuates the canards in the full down deflection. Intake, in fact, let's shove that to auto, see what that does. We've got covers and chocks are interestingly non-typhoon related, but for simplicity of the user, uh, you can then toggle away the covers by clicking there. We'll leave the chocks in. We've also got the stick hide, which is a switch, which is unusual. I prefer a click spot so you don't have these uh, non-authentic switches, but it's fairly simple to remove and put back the stick. What's to remember about kind of slightly unusual switches. We've got the, uh, I guess, anti-cold flash switch here. If we have a look on the outside, we've got no pilot. If we look back in here, flick that switch, and now we have a pilot. So you can toggle the visibility using that switch. Further down the left-hand side, we've got some bits and pieces, and I'm not gonna to profess to know everything in this uh, cockpit because it is fairly complicated. We have the throttles, we have the stick hide, uh, the canopy open and shut, and then the landing gear and landing lights. The landing lights appear to be on by default, so I'll switch those off for now. And the park and brake toggles there, and it's park and brake on. Data entry panel is on the left-hand side, more of that later. We've also got the uh, manual data entry or data entry submenus up here, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Three MFDs, UFCP with a screen, we'll talk more about that in a moment. A very large head-up display. Uh, and we have the caution warning panel on the right-hand side, down the right hand console we have uh, on off switches to the aft end you can see a uh, transponder radio one radio two so on off switches we've got the engine start panel and electrics here for starting her up apu outboard of that we've got uh, lp cock or fuel shut off switches and then some anti-ice then some lighting uh, then some more lighting and then some uh, ecs and demist it doesn't look like the ecs functions or maybe that's just because of the engines are off that is the cockpit and down to the seats, I don't think seat pins and seat arming is modeled like it is on the India Fox Deco 346. Um, so that is not part of the process. That is the cockpit tour. So let's get to starting this thing up and I'll talk some more about the systems. The first things before I get in, I'd make sure all the switches are in the right place. So I've already mentioned the landing light uh, being to land. We'll make sure the fuel cutoff switches are on. To the left hand side, you have engine fuel. Those switches need to be forward. You have a fuel cutoff switch off to the right hand side. And then we're going to go into switching the battery on, the avionics on, generator one, generator two. 
I'm going to switch on my nav lights because I'm in the aircraft and the power is applied. Straight away we can go for the APU, so we'll select APU to start. And you can hear that running in the background. Now I have to say now that we've got the noises running, I've been asked to say that these are actually F-18 default sounds. But they are in the queue, they have got intentions of bringing a realistic sound set to this aircraft after release. Okay, so that will be an update. So for you connoisseurs that can spot the difference between F-18 and Typhoon sounds, yes, it's an F-18 sound for now. Okay, the APU is running and now we just have to start the engine. We can leave the canopy open if we wish. We've confirmed that the uh, jocks and correction the covers are removed, so let's start her up. Right hand first. On the MFD, of course, we can set engine and you can see the NH is winding up. Once that gets to about 20 or so, the TBT, the turbine blade temperature will start increasing to signify that the light off has occurred. It does sound uh, pretty good actually, even with the default F-18 sounds, for being honest. And with the magic of video editing, we'll flash through engine the, the left engine startup so you don't have to sit and wait for that to happen. Left engine, start. Once the engine start has completed, start switch will toggle to the off position. Once the engines are started, the canals will move to their horizontal position. And uh, we just wait for the start switch to go off, there it goes. Once the engines are started up, we can then switch off the APU. Two engines started, so let's, now that we've started up, we'll shut the canopy. We'll apply the parking brake, which appears to be on anyway, and we'll remove the jocks. Doesn't sound like there's much difference between canopy open and canopy shut, let's just try that again. Not really, but that might come with the next sound set. Okay, next, before we taxi, we're going to have a look at MFD functionality. We'll remove the stick using this toggle on the left, and you can see we've got three MFDs. The central one has a navigation page. We have a systems page and uh, a weapons page on the left-hand side. Now, for the map page, you can change where it's displayed by toggling. That's left and right, but you can move diagonally up. So we'll leave that one in the top left because it's next to the switches for the data entry. Or the... Uh, engine and systems page, you've got fuel, eng, hide, uh, waypoints. I have a basic waypoint uh, navigation in, I'll show you that later. And frequencies, if you click on frequencies, leave it a little while to toggle or to collate, and that displays your nearest airfields, bearings, and range, which I think is a really nice touch. You then have stores for the loadout, which uh, is representative of what we have, although I believe we have SRAMs on the outboard. They look like they may not be displayed here. And then we have the HUD repeater here. The LF page, I love this page. Look at this, this looks like an authentic FLIR type of page. Um, yes, it doesn't include trees and anything above the ground, but it looks really nice. And I prefer this presentation over the attitude indicator you see on the right hand side. So there's the basic MFD function for the systems pages. The right hand one is the same, but we're gonna leave that one on stalls. Uh, before we talk about the left hand page, let's look at the UFCP. Now this is a kind of an elephant in the room and it's actually, for those that know it, is the Garmin screen. It gives you direct to flight plan procedures, waypoint info nearest, which is there in case you like using it, you're familiar with Garmin and you find it easier. It is not Typhoon authentic, but it's fair enough. I understand why they did it. I just think it doesn't sit well having a Typhoon and a Garmin screen. Let me know what you think in the comments below. The rest of the HUD is, uh, we'll talk about once we get airborne. Now the complicated part is data entry on here. So we're going to follow a GPS route so I can toggle through ranges. We're north of Scotland, of course. We're gonna go around. We've got uh, Kinos in there. We've got a random lake here, and then we're into um, Inverness. We can toggle ranges as required, GPS being the default method of navigation. Let's talk about the data entry at the uh, top end. So we've got radio one, radio two. It gives you a sub-menu on the right-hand side. It also gives you the method of entering the information on the data entry panel. So radio one, anything VHF is navigation, i.e. VOR, anything UHF is the comms, and anything that has the brackets, the triangular brackets around them, is where you're gonna enter the data. So 
if I was to enter 1143, 114 decimal 3, enter, now I believe that is a local VOR that we should be able to pick up. And then if I go over to AIDS, nav mode, VOR1, you can now see that we're presented with the course deviation bar. It doesn't look like we have a bearing pointer, and that might be my ignorance and the fact I don't know how to switch it on. But we can set up our course bar as we need to, and we can see we've got nav1, ADN, and a uh, what looks like just to be a range at this stage. But that's how you get this presentation up. If you don't get the course bar, it's because you're not in range of that beacon, or you've got an incorrect frequency set. But for me, I'm now going to set the ILS for when we get there, 1085, and we can also use the UFCP. So 1085 is now the ILS. You can see that's confirmed on the data entry panel as well. And because we're not in range of it, we've lost our indications up here. But when we get in range of the ILS, they'll automatically toggle to the appropriate flight, uh, uh, final approach track, and we can fly the ILS. If I want to change the transponder, then XPDR, you see the XPDR page on the data entry page. Then you can set 4577 or whatever you like, enter. You can go page down to change where the brackets are. And then you can set another one, so 7001, which will be our low level frequency, or the score. So you can set multiple up on this page here, which is cool. And on the right hand side, you can see XPDR manual. And if we toggle in some modes, 1, 2, 3, Alpha, and Charlie, you can now see 1, 2, 3, Alpha, and Charlie with manual selected. If I click that to standby, it shows a standby on the right hand side. You'll also note that IFF is separate to the transponder. If you find that you can't flick this standby to norm, look lower right, check these switches, and if that is in the off position, that's why. Also, think about let's tune all these on. I'm not sure if these are linked because it seemed like the radios were working without them being on. But maybe they're on already. I can't remember what I'm doing here. Let's just flick some switches. There we go. All switches are forwards. So that is how to enter the transponder. We'll go up. So I'm presuming now with normal selected and that highlighted 4577 is the code with modes 1, 2, 3, alpha and Charlie selected. If you want to change the IFF, that is INT, and you get a similar page to the transponder, you can then set it up here. You can then set to norm and you'll notice on the right hand side you get manual for the IFF. The TACAN, uh, if I can remember correctly, I think it's under AIDS, TAC data, data entry panel. I believe the TACAN here is 52 but I'm not sure if it's implemented but we'll go enter. The 52 x-ray is in the current channel if you press enter again it changes to Yankee. You can also see an autopilot panel, Now, normally this is on the throttle as part of the HOTAS, but it's up here for ease of use of those people with this on. So before we finish, let's have a look at a couple more operations of this MFD, the navigation page. We've already talked about the range. You can change to HSI if you don't want to have the map in the background. Uh, you can change map tack, and I believe this function is to have um, AI and other players on the screen, so you'll have traffic, which I think is really cool. I haven't tested it nor do I have traffic enabled at this time. You can change between a half and a, well, almost half and a 360 page, and it got track up, north up, and mag or true. So that's basic functionality of the MFD and the data entry page. And I think we're getting towards the time where we should take this thing flying. So keep it nice and slow when you taxi this, the turn radius isn't very small. So plan ahead. Keep the throttles fairly well back so you don't go too fast. And you can monitor the ground speed in the head-up display. If you want Mac, you can toggle that to Mac by pressing the GSM button. Now normally go through flaps, lights, IFF and PITO, but of course we don't have flaps in this aircraft, they just have flaperons and the canards. So no flaps. Lights will change. Let's have a look. Anti coals white. Put landing light on. That'll work. I think that will do. IFF we have in manual. We're already squawking. We're not going to. Well, we've got the IFF and the transponder on. And the PITO is down here on the right hand side. Done. PITO done. Time for the takeoff. So let's go. I'm loving the flashing old short lines. They're good. We like those.
So I think around about 130, 140 knots for the rotate. We'll fly it off the runway. It loves to fly high alpha, and we'll talk about the HUD presentation ever so shortly. That looks cool. Right, here we go for the takeoff. Let's ignite the burners. Nice animations, and off we go. Speed picks up quickly. 100, 120, 130, gently on the back stick. Climbing, gear up. And we're going to the moon. 200 knots, about 60, 55 degrees nose up. Awesome. And that is it. We are airborne, going pretty much straight up. Got a lot of external stores on, so I'm not expecting gross amounts of performance. We're up here at five and a half thousand feet, and let's go for the supersonic run. Let's put Mac in our head up display. And put the nose down and get us through the barrier. Now, of course, the uh, Typhoon is capable of super cruise, and it does super cruise in this aircraft. It's 0.75. Point nine, and we're supersonic. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so to know that you have got reheat engaged, look at your caution warning panel. You'll notice that VIB starts first, and then you get the reheat light, so you know that you've got it engaged. That's nice to know from in cockpit. We are cruising along just under Mac. Here we go, subsonic again, and we're going to turn right back towards Kin Loss and pop into low level. Look at that bristling with weapons. Oh, that looks that looks cool. Yeah, we like that. Before we go into low level, let's check out some of the handling dynamics now that we're down here at uh, 330 knots. So the Typhoon should have carefree handling, and I know the Microsoft Flight Sim core programming just doesn't allow it. The default systems are really not very good at the high alpha, close to stall dynamics. So I don't fault the developers much on that at all. They just try their best. In terms of, now here's a question for the masses. In terms of maneuverability and dynamics, when I pitch full up, the canards pitch down. I push full down, the canards pitch up, which is doesn't quite compute in my head, so put your comments below whether you think that's correct. I have my own answers, but I'll ask the community, let me know what you think. Normally when you're cruising along with the flaperons and the canards, they will do whatever they need to do to keep the aircraft stable. But at extreme pitch angles, you'd expect to do something slightly different. Uh, so that's that, we're here at 200 knots. Interestingly, to look in the HUD, you can see that the uh, flight path marker, or what on other aircraft is a flight path marker, is actually the longitudinal flight data. And it's this little square that is your vector. So worth bearing that in mind, it is crazily different from every other aircraft you fly. Not saying it's inaccurate, I'm just saying it's something to get used to. There we go, 220 knots, let's pull, pull back stick. Returning, returning, and now we stop. We've kind of G-stalled. We don't have stall warner, we're not technically falling out of the sky, but because we're not turning as quickly as we were, it's just lost all the performance that it needs, or that it had. So I recommend, if you want to fight with this aircraft, that you keep it around about 300, 350 knots, and just scan your speed and pull back on the stick no further than to keep the speed that you have, if that kind of makes sense. If you go slow speed, you can do some crazy stuff. Whee! Uh, and, then <laughs> and then it does something. But again, it's it's Microsoft Flight Sim. The uh, slow speed dynamics are a bit off. But high speed, here we go, into low level. Let's do some of this. Now this looks cool. Oh, even picking up the shadow on the ground. Very cool, I like that when that happens. 
And let's fly through Kinloss. I think if I'm looking at the little map, we're heading in the right direction. Anyone seen an airfield around here? Now if you want Radalt, currently we're on Barrow, you have to click for Radalt. And I presume that is now Radalt. Be useful to know which one is selected by looking at the HUD. I guess you can do it by looking at the switch. Here we go, let's go up, let's do some aerobatics then whilst we're here at Kinloss. Give them a show. Change that to Barrow. And here we go, looking over the top. Like I said, be very gentle with your stick inputs at slow speed because it takes a while for the vector to catch up. I also note that there's a bit of a delay in the back stick in the pitch. So if I'm going full up here and I push full down, it takes a little while. That's full back stick. That's full forward stick. You know, 300 knots is quite a bit of momentum. And again, not saying it's inaccurate, I'm just saying it's one to be aware of because as I go around the corner with full back stick and then roll out, the nose, oh, hello, can I stop turning? The nose wants to pitch up a little bit. So there seems to be a delay in the change in pitch angle. Here we go, let's try a barrel roll and then we'll head off to Inverness for our ILS. I guess I should fly outside for a little bit because everyone likes to see the outside of the airplane. Nice. And one more time for the loop. just a factor of being outside not knowing what my speed is going too slow and then the wacky Microsoft flight sim fly-by-wire dynamics kicks in and does some crazy stuff so it's a word of word of caution if you're flying from the outside doing arrows it's worth having your speed on a, uh, a HUD displayed all right here we go what do we need to do 1085 we seem to have that dialed in here that let's go aids nav mode we are what be Oh, our one is on. Let's slow ourselves down using the speed brake. There's the speed brake. Oh, we're already down at 170 knots. Where's the airfield? I think it's over there somewhere. Usually I'd get vectors to find that makes it a lot easier. They're 12 miles away. U31 has already been set on the approach course. And I can see Inverness on the top left of my MFD. So we're in a decent place. Now I'm not doing this procedurally correct. I'm just trying to intercept and just show you what the displays look like for the ILS. Whilst I'm uh, approaching the center line and you like the video, please uh, feel free to like and subscribe. It greatly helps support the channel. It gives me the motivation to keep doing this. Uh, although I do love flying all these jets in Microsoft Flight Center. But let me know what you think of this aircraft. Is it something you're going to get? Is it something you'd like to see improved? Is there anything you've seen that doesn't quite sit well? The developers tend to read these comments so you can have your input at this stage. Also here, let's configure. I didn't show you the refuel probe, so let's do that. I'm not trying to distract myself. There we go. Refuel probe. Apparently it gives you another 25% worth of fuel, which is quite a nice touch. Just need a tanker now. Ah, oh, here we go. Intercepting, course deviation bar comes across. 
It's about a three degree glide path, I think. Let's slow this sucker down. I think about 160 knots should do. Now remember, we're looking for that small square as our vector and we want the staple to be next to it. 170 knots is too fast. There we go, come on. So it looks about 155 knots is where we're at. You can see in the HUD you've got presentation for the localizer and the glide path, and you can see in the left MFD where I've put my navigation, you can see the standard course deviation index. I haven't tried the approach mode ILS if that's modeled, I'm just flying this manually. So with a three degree glide path, once I've intercepted the localizer, I'm putting that little vector square on the three degrees that should keep me down the glide slope. With any luck, I can see I'm slightly left of localizer. You can see in the HUD, the localizer bar is off to the right, and you can see on the uh, MFD, the localizer bar is off to the right as well. That three degrees on the glide path is working out nicely. You can see the speed is now stable, the E is stable. Everything's working out pretty nice. It's a case of just cross-checking your way down. Now, this Inverness scenery, by the way, is done by UK2000. I do rate their products quite highly, so it's worth checking out if you like Scotland. I'm going a bit high, let's go down. Let's put the, in fact, whilst I mention it, if you've not seen my how to land any jet video, then please check that out. I'll show you how to use the staple. and It'll show you how to land more basic jets as well. So the HUD looks like the five degree bar is next to the pappies. So I'm not sure if the HUD is perfectly collimated or perfectly uh, calibrated, but here we go to landing. Idle, lower it off, a bit of a firm landing. I'm gonna pop the speed brake, apply the tow brakes. I'll demo the lift dump. So that would work if you land, but when you take off it delays putting, I don't know what the what it requires to not have the lift dump in auto. But I just think it's worth not selecting it to auto until you're airborne and then hopefully once you land it'll uh, act appropriately. That's lift dump. That's the Typhoon. I hope that was a useful video for you. The release is imminent. Please let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. Until the next time, take care, fly safe.